Welcome to KLOS, new and approved. I'm your host, Matt Pinfield, and my guest is the incredible Todd Rundgren. Todd, great to see you, and uh, I just want to say, you know, whenever I got the chance to talk to you, I, it's always been such a, such a joy and a pleasure for me. You know, I mean, it goes back to, you know, really discovering you, you know, when I was probably about just about 11 years old, and I got the Something Anything album, the double album, which uh, I fell in love with as a kid. But I'd had the seven-inch single of, uh, in 1970, of We Gotta Get You a Woman, when I was probably about nine. And, uh, you know, and then, <laughs> you know, a, a couple of years later, um, discovered that you were a part of a band called Naz uh, when I got this Nuggets compilation album and heard the great Open Your Eyes and have followed your career ever since. And you've made albums that I absolutely love that you've made yourself and albums that you produced that are all favorites. So it's always an absolute pleasure. So uh, with that, I want to say welcome. And um, it's great to see you. Todd, we're here to talk about a couple different things. First of all, Space Force, this brand new album, which I'm very excited about that you've done with collaborations. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that first. So, Todd, tell me about the, the latest record, because there's a bunch of great collaborations on there. Uh, where did you come up with the concept to do your, your latest solo album this way? Well, um, my last album, which was called White Knight, was um, <clears throat> my first serious attempt at collaborations in like um, probably decades because when I moved to, uh, to Hawaii, which is where I am now, it, uh, it became a lot more difficult to call a session. You know, a lot of my music sometimes is spontaneous and I don't plan a lot beforehand. And so trying to get some players over here on short notice just wasn't practical. So I was making the records pretty much all myself. And I got the, uh, started to get the feeling that I was in an echo chamber. I was not, um, I wasn't introducing new ideas like I would if I had been working with other musicians. So I decided that I would do a collaborative record and that was White Knight. And that turned out uh, to be a lot of fun and very helpful for me. <laughs> but uh, I wrote most of the material on it. Um, some uh, collaborations in the writing department, but most of it was written by me. And when I got to this record, I thought, okay, let's go all in. You know, I'm still kind of um, controlling the, the process a little bit too much because I'm writing all the material. So I decided on this record that I would go to artists that I wanted to work with and ask them if they had any unfinished songs or orphaned projects you know that um they just you know they started them and never got around to finishing them and uh that's the bulk of this record um mostly material written by other people occasionally i collaborate on the writing um but um i'm all in now you know i'm yeah. all in with the collaborations because i'm actually letting them determine a lot of the agenda which is amazing. So a guy that I've always thought, uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple people on here that are prolific songwriters that, that remind me of your work ethic and uh, obviously uh, Rivers Cuomo from Weezer. Tell me about why he was one of the guys that you wanted to work with. Well, I've been a Weezer fan, you know, since the Sweater song. And, uh, and uh, I was playing, uh, I was sitting in with The Roots on uh, Tonight Show, on The Late Show, whatever it's called, I don't know. And uh, Weezer was the musical guest. And uh, I was always thinking about, you know, who could I get to collaborate with me? So I just on a flyer, I saw uh, Rivers Cuomo in the hall and said, you know, I'm working on a record. Have you got maybe, you know, some demos or unfinished songs or something like that, you know, that we might uh, finish up together? And he sent me about 20 songs you know almost two dozen different ideas some more or less complete and some of them just sort of fragmentary and i kind of hit on this one on uh, down with the ship mostly because it um it had a very sort of light atmosphere to it and i tend to get sometimes a little too deep uh lyrically so i wanted to do something fun and uh that's what we came up with yeah, it's great. 
Another great songwriter that uh, I, I think of when I think of the songwriters like yourself that I love is uh, Neil Finn, of course. Split Ends, the stuff he wrote with them and Crowded House. And then, of course, you know, played with Fleetwood Mac as well recently. But, that's, I mean, I just thought, well, that, when I saw that you were going to work with him on a track, I said, God, that's well, that sounds like a great dream team to me. Um, tell me about working with Neil Finn and, and the idea of doing that. <clears throat> Uh, in point of fact, I've never met him in person. <laughs> uh, and most of our correspondence has been uh, through email. And that happens with uh, a lot of the collaborators that I work with. You know, we don't get on the phone and start talking about what we're doing. We just send versions back and forth and commentary about where the music is supposed to go. Um, so I've never met M Neil, but... Uh, as you were, I was a fan of uh, Split Ends and Crowded House, and uh, I guess I heard that he was playing with Fleetwood Mac, and that kind of put a bee in my bonnet, and I got his contact information and, and asked him the same question I ask everyone. Have you got something unfinished that, you know, you'd like me to listen to? And, uh, and that was kind of... That was the first official collaboration, I think, for this record. Um, I did have a song that was left over from White Knight. That's the one with Narcy, um, a rapper from Montreal. Um, it, we just didn't get it finished in time. So I still thought it was, you know, it's, it's a collaboration. And I still thought it was worthwhile having on the record. So you could say that that was the first song. But in terms of new songs for this record in particular, um, the song I did with Neil, um, Artist in Residence is the title of it, and that was the first one that I did. It's great. We're working with Rick Nielsen, um, have you guys been friends for a long time? I mean, certainly you guys, uh, he's obviously been a fan of yours for a long time, and, um, you know, I, when I think of things like Deface the Music or even going back to Couldn't I Just Tell You, these, you know, great songs of yours, and that mutual love for the Beatles and, and just great melody and British Invasion... Tell me about your relationship with Rick and having him on the record. Well, I'm trying to remember the first time that I met Rick and the band, and it might have been at a gig. It might have been the infamous Nelson's Ledges gig that we did with um, Cheap Trick and the Cars, which was in uh, in Ohio somewhere, and we had a, a something of a riot that people burned down the front gates and flooded inside. It was typical sort of bad festival behavior. But, you know, we became, we became friends. Part of it is because we have a, uh, something of a shared history. When I left the NAS, um, Rick and Robin essentially formed up with Tom Mooney and Stuckey, I think, to form another band, which, I think at one point they called the sick men of Europe. <laughs> and, <laughs> That's great. And, it's what a name, right? Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of wonder what kind of music was that going to be? Yeah. But uh, uh, this was like right before they, you know, actually got the idea to put cheap trick together. So, um, so we have a, a mutual history there and we had a lot to talk about because we had both been in the NAS in some form or another. And, uh, and uh, yeah, we got real, uh, real sort of chummy. Hung out whenever we were both in the same town. I would always um, sit in with the band on a on a song or two if I would be in a town where they were. Um, hang out at each other's houses and and stuff like that. We became pretty good friends. Uh, but when I moved to Hawaii, I don't see people <laughs> as much anymore. But um, right before COVID happened, we were both on a cruise, you know, one of these uh, yacht rock things. Uh, they were the headliners. Uh, they came in, uh, they flew into San Juan, Puerto Rico, because they didn't actually sail on the ship. The boat was in port for two nights and they played for two nights in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And that was when I, you know, put the thumb screws to, uh, uh, to Rick about doing something together because we had talked about it for a real long time. Uh, talked about doing something again with Cheap Trick. Um, but then after that, he uh, 
kind of out of the blue. I didn't hear from him for a while. And out of the blue, he sent me this idea, and it had a title that was pretty obscene. And we both agreed we couldn't go with that title, so we went with something that was like obscene in a different way. So. Yeah. That's great that you did that. You know, I also love, uh, you know, the connection to the roots, being a Philly guy, a guy who came up in the Philly music scene like yourself, you know what I mean? And those early days of, uh, you know, Philly, Gamble Huff, I mean, everything else that was there was so much great stuff. Mm-hmm. You always, you did that great cover of La La Means I Love You and the other things and over the years. Tell me about your your meeting with, with the roots and, and did you ever, did you ever get to talk about like Philly when you, uh, when you first met those guys? Um, the first thing that I did with the roots, which was kind of a surprise, I heard, I heard little rumors, you know, that, um, that Questlove was a fan, uh, and Questlove is like everybody's fan, you know, he's yeah. musicological and he loves all kinds of music. And they were doing a project at the time, which was a tribute record to Squeaks and asked me to do, uh, a song for that record. So I did bang bang for that record. And then we thought about doing something else. And I sort of, because of Questlove's connection to Dave Chappelle, you know, I used to be on the Chappelle show a lot, uh, even before the people knew much about the roots, they saw Questlove with the, with the pick in his hair and yeah. stuff like that on the Dave Chappelle show. And, uh, and so after we did that, I kind of went, to them and said you know maybe we can do like a bigger project i've always wanted to do something sort of like reuben and the jets i wanted to do a funny record you know ever since frank zappa died something has gone out of music you know that sort of cynical kind of self-commentating thing about pop music that frank was so good at and uh and so we started working on a record together and uh, the Roots, they're Philly guys, and they, I don't know whether this is still true, but at the time, you know, they're Philly guys. You know, the show would tape four nights a week. They taped two shows on, usually on Thursday, Thursday and Friday. And then they go back to Philly for the weekend. So while they were in New York, they barely left their little rehearsal studio. Uh, they would probably just go somewhere to sleep, and that was it. They come in the next day, start rehearsing for the show. And they have a little recording set up in there and they would just make demos all the time, just instrumental demos of little musical ideas. And they started sending them to me and I started putting music to them. And the song that's on the record now called Godiva Girl, we already released it as a single. That was one of four that we got completed before uh, we variously got distracted by other things. And (laughs) that project who knows maybe one day that project will actually see the light of day um i've got more tracks from them and i could write more songs and uh and uh who knows yeah that'd be great you know i was thinking about it recently uh todd how some of the things you've written in commentary speaking of uh, commentary on the world records that still resonate all these years later with all the world changes is Something like Oops, Wrong Planet, which the Utopia album is, is such a brilliant record. Those songs all still hold up in such an incredible way. And uh, I remember listening to Trapped and, you know, talking to people about some of the songs on the record, Love in Action. Just, there's, I mean, there's so many great things, but is it, ama- is it amazing sometimes when you see some of the things that you've written in, you know, in your history and how they will still kind of take on a new meaning as time goes on? Well, in 1975, I released released an album called liars yeah (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. enough said yeah right right it's amazing now we've got a whole political party that has transmogrified into the lying party you know the party that can't tell the truth about even the most obvious shit so it's like um in some ways i must have seen it coming although it wasn't an act of prophecy at the time it was really most of uh, my inspiration when I write songs is um, anthropological. I try and focus on some aspect of human behavior and try and figure out why it manifests the way it does. You know, why do we act the way we do? Why do we say the things we say? 
You know, why do we believe the things that we believe? It's like, why, why, why all the time trying to put all of that in some sort of perspective. Um, the other, the reason why I make music, the overarching reason, aside from the fact that, you know, it feels good to make and that I have an audience that expects it. Um, for me, it's like, um, it's uh, self-analysis. Uh, I get a, I have a thought in my head and the only way that I can properly examine it is to get it out of my head, to objectivize it, you know, put it into a song or something like that. And then after I've done that, I can say, hmm, that made sense. Or I could say, hmm, that made no sense at all. You know, and that's how I learn about myself, you know, by essentially objectivizing ideas in my head in musical form and then after that process is done uh ideally i have new perspective on on that particular issue it's great i mean you know throughout the years you've written songs that are beautiful songs that are absolutely funny some that are heartbreaking some that are sarcastic i mean it's, it just it covers the gamut which is why you know you've, you've given us so much great material over the years and I, and we're all very grateful for that you know todd i wanted to also ask you if you didn't mind I want to talk to you about a couple of the productions that you did uh, because there's just, I mean, it, it, these things have become so important on a lot of these records. And more recently, obviously, when Breaking Bad, <clears throat> you know, exploded and the final episode showed Baby Blue by Badfinger and the song had this rebirth again. Can we talk about producing straight up and uh, do you know, what, if a memory you might have of, of that session and working with the guys in Badfinger? Well, I... Um, kind of the things that when I was young had blighted me became assets when I became a professional. Uh, my uh, short attention span, uh, my natural musical ability, but also, you know, matched with my sort of antsiness and, um, and my inability to kind of like stay in one place for very long without feeling like I'm not learning anything or that I'm, you know, kind of atrophying. So when I first started making records, I was very, I was very efficient compared to a lot of other people. I early on started learning about the engineering aspect of it so that I would not have to uh, c try and learn a, a certain new language every time you have a different engineer. Um, I could just simply be very specific. I wouldn't say like make it brighter or make it, you know, fatter or at least, you know, these very subjective terms. I could say, you know, bump it up a 10 K, you know, three DB like that. So, yeah. uh, so I could just as easily and often did most times engineer the records myself. It just cut out a lot of the middleman and then made, made the process go a lot quicker. And that's what I became uh, noted for, was being able to get in there, get the band to start playing, get the takes down, you know, make the proper suggestions, move the process along, not waste a lot of money in the studio or time, uh, not let the uh, energy go out of the process after you've done the 20th take of the song or something like that. Um, and... Uh, Badfinger had been in the studio for a year trying to make a record. Um, th they made a whole record with Jeff Emmerich, uh, who had been uh, engineer for the Beatles of their latter, latter years. And uh, what I heard was that uh, Apple America, their label, uh, didn't, they weren't impressed with the record. And they said, no, try again. So Badfinger went back and started over again with George Harrison. George at the time was in the thrall of Phil Spector. So everything that George touched sounded like Phil Spector. And by the time, and, and eventually he got all wrapped up in doing the concert for Bangladesh and didn't have time to finish the project. You know, he'd gotten a half a dozen songs in or something like that. And uh, so that's when I stepped into the picture and I just kind of 
first thing I did was start over. First thing I did was said, let's record some new material. And they had been writing material the whole time, you know, trying to satisfy um, the demands, I guess, of the U.S. label. And I got in there and we recorded, I think, uh, it, Baby Blue might have been the very first song that we recorded together. Um, we recorded another few, then we went um, back and looked at the things they had already done and took a couple from the Jeff Emmerich sessions and a couple from the George Harrison sessions and started uh, re-recording and replacing stuff on those so that they would, so that the record would sound, you know, like it was all done at the same time yeah. instead of in three different sessions. And, uh, and then released it and we got lucky, got two hit singles off of it. Um, the day after day two, a classic. So those were both, you know, hits. On yeah, the and uh, and then their whole world started to unravel. Yeah, Some it's guy. one of the most heartbreaking stories in the history of yeah. rock with uh, with uh, Pete Ham and and and, uh, and 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 Evans. You know, I I just Tom Evans was terrible. But let's talk about you know what. It, what I've loved about the, the fact with all the records that you work with, you work with some unbelievable classic records, which. I, you take the New York Dolls' first album, for instance. I mean, it's it's more influential, of course, than it was successful in those days. And uh, a lot of people didn't understand it. You know what I mean? I, rem I remember, and, and of course, historically, everybody knows. But it's has this certain great rawness to it. Can you talk to me about that? Because it was one of those things. How was it working with those guys as this new New York band when you were brought onto the project <clears throat> to uh, to work on that album? Well, I was living in New York City in the mid '70s, and I had bought a house upstate. And I was getting tired of the city, and I knew that I was going to leave. And there was a scene happening, and at the time they called it the New York scene. And it was very like it was it was more art based than music based in a sense. Yeah. In that, it, you know nobody was a great player, <laughs> yeah. you know, or a great singer, you know, they just, it was, it, it was all sort of like statements, you know, it's kind of like more like, a, you know, like Manchester, England, art school bands and stuff like that, you know, to produce Pink Floyd and, and, uh, you know, and so many bands came out of art schools uh, there because they, you know, essentially built it around a concept. Um, the concept, I guess, for the New York Dolls was um, was retro Rolling Stones. You know, Rolling Stones uh, in their drag era, you know, yeah. and they were dressing up like ladies. Yeah, and uh, and so they dressed up very glam. You know, did their hair, did makeup, and things like that. That was part of their part of their whole look, part of what made them. And uh, so I knew I was leaving New York City, and I thought, okay, I'll do one of these bands before I leave as kind of like a farewell to New York City. And the dolls were the kind of like far and away the most uh, talked about and successful and in some ways coherent. A lot of the other bands, they wrote songs, but completely forgettable songs and stuff. <laughs> yeah. So they wrote songs with hooks in them you know, yeah. that people could remember. Um, and uh, the making of the record was just a carnival, a circus, you know, a various combinations of crowd management and band management, you know, yeah. uh, things like that. You know, it was hard enough to get the band all in the same place to play. You know, they, they would be off doing various activities like, you know, drinking or drugging or hitting on girls and stuff like that, you know, because the studio was constantly full of groupies and journalists. Yeah. You prefer and the and it was the like beginning of a new kind of journalism. All these journalists were there because they, it was finally a band that they could understand. You know, they thought, I could be in that band. Yeah. I know three chords. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. I could yeah. be in that band. And yeah. that was, I think, what kind of fueled the whole punk movement it wasn't called punk at the time like i say it was called the it was called the new york sound and it was actually john lydon who who coined the term punk and cited the new york dolls as being highly influential the new york dolls were uh most people don't know this but they went to england and became like really hot for a really short time yeah and uh 
And so a lot of bands in England were influenced by them. And you could say that they were seminal in the in the British punk scene. And that's kind of where it started. Punk started in England and then came to the U.S. afterwards. Yeah, it's amazing. And let's shift to the Grand Funk uh, years because uh, you had unbelievable success with Grand Funk. Here's a band who built a, you know, a following touring and, you know, they sold mm-hmm. out Shea Stadium on the strength of their Closer to Home album because I'm your captain was such a big hit, but you brought him to a, you were working with him. It came to a whole new level, Todd, you know, with, uh, with shining on and we're an American band and those albums and those tracks. I mean, the sound is still, I mean, we're an American band. It still sounds unbelievable. The minute, like, you know, everything about the, that recording, talk to me about working with them and how that whole thing started. Well, the band was going through a big transition at the time. They had new management, Still had the same label, but all new management. And they got, uh, yeah, they, originally they Knight? were kind of discovered by a guy named Terry Knight. Yeah. You know, all, a bunch of people come from the, the Detroit, the Michigan area. You know, Bob Seeger and and uh, <laughs> the Ryder. Amboy Dukes, you yeah. know, Ted Nugent. Yeah. So there's a whole kind of like quasi white R&B scene that was going on around Michigan, you know probably highly influenced by what was going on in Detroit because that was a black music scene. And um, and they were all part of it. They would all do R&B songs. And Terry Knight had his own band called Terry Knight and the Pack. Yeah. And I Who and Have he, Nothing. They had the one hit, I Who Have Nothing, which a bunch of people have done, but that was their hit, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they never went too far, you know, but he moved into, he decided to become a manager and producer. Yeah. And, uh, and so he managed Grand Funk and produced their records. And he was really not a very good producer. You know, he kind of just kind of turn on the tape machine producer. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, he didn't, you know, he didn't help the band edit themselves or improve the quality of their material or anything like that. So the band became famous just as like a jam band. Um, they, uh, you know, they wanted to be like Cream, but they didn't have the same level of musicianship as Cream, you know. Yeah. And so they would do very long, sort of boring jams and stuff like that. I remember seeing them at the Fillmore East one time because I lived like five blocks from there. We'd see everybody who came through. And uh, and there was uh, Mark Farner shirtless with an Indian headdress on. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, uh and at the time, I didn't think much of them. I mean, they did, they were doing like covers and just like songs that were excuses for long jams. But uh, as I say, they went through a whole transition, got new management, got rid of Terry Knight. Um, Terry had uh, done one thing. He was a great promoter. You know, by that time, they had gotten the biggest billboard that had ever been painted in Times Square was an entire block long and went around the corner as well. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, and so everybody knew about the band, but they had never cracked, you know, that, you know, they'd never solved the thing of AM radio at that point. So, um, and so, uh, you know, I went to see them play their new material and they had su- kind of started to understand that we need to write songs, you know, not jams. And so I got to the band at just like the perfect time, you know, when they were ready to make that kind of transition. Um, You know, they were already sort of like pliable in the sense that they knew what they were doing, couldn't go on. You know, they had to start doing things differently. And uh, it was one of the most miraculous sort of record industry experiences I ever had because they... They had it all planned out, you know, and if any part of the plan had not gone off on schedule, all of this might not have happened, you know, all that all, all of that success. But they had a release date for the single before it was ever recorded, release date for the album before it was ever recorded, you yeah. know. And so we were in the studio like a week before the release date working on the first single. Wow. And for, and the first day we did the track to We're an American Band. Uh, that's, you know, we set up. In other words, the first day, we first day in the studio, set up, got all the sounds, did the track for American Band, came in the next morning and finished the track. And uh, we were in Criterion Studios and they had a mastering 
lab in the studios. We went directly into the mastering lab and cut the single master. Only us that heard it. Nobody else, the label hasn't heard it. You know, <laughs> yeah. we're the only ones who heard the damn thing. We go directly into the lab and cut the single and it, and it goes directly to the plant. And within days, the radio version is going out. And a week later, the record is on the charts. Yeah. Oh, a, the week after we record the song, the record is on the charts. That was in the days where that was in the days where pre-orders and radio ads were enough to get you on the charts. You didn't have to sell anything yet. All you had to do was have uh, record stores pre-ordering uh, the single. Yeah, within a week it was in the top forty. Before we had finished the record, it was in the top five. <laughs> yeah, and by the time Before the album came out, it was number one album. single. It was yeah. the number one single, right at that point. You know? uh, yeah, and the, you know, and the album is released gold. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's just, that's an amazing. It's, uh, that's, it a, was the most amazing thing ever that you know that's ever happened to me in the music industry. I heard that you, uh, you know, this. I don't know if this is a rumor. So I always wanted to ask you this, and I don't think I ever have. Um, when you, I'm, I'm taking time to find a single for "Shining On," they obviously did the locomotion, right? The little Eva song. Now, there was a rumor mm-hmm. someone said years ago that you had seen Raspberries cover it and said, you guys should probably do this song. I saw another band do it. It's, it's a great idea. Is there any truth to that rumor? There's no truth to that. And there's no truth to the idea that Mark Farner had the idea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. I no, wanted to had, know. We had, finished, we had pretty much finished the record. And we, you know, we thought, okay, Shining On's got to be the first single. It's the, you know, like we're an American band, you know. But we're not sure we got a follow up, you know, or more of a sure thing for a single. And I'm not sure where I'd heard the song, but I heard the original, the Little Eva version, you know, and uh, and suggested to them. And it occurred to me, Grand Funk Railroad, Locomotion, of course, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> perfect sense. So, like, you know, went into the studio and cobbled out our our version of Locomotion. And it became a bigger hit, actually, than Shine It On. Yeah, it went right to another number one record. I mean, it's unbelievable how uh, how that worked out. It's great. You know, it's I know I look at the things you did throughout the years, whether it's a band like Connect from Canada, like Pursuit of Happiness, or the third Psychedelic Furs record, Forever Now, which I thought you just did an amazing job on that stuff. But you continued to work with so many uh, great bands. But I'd ra- I want to go back uh, uh, to Something Anything, which is you know uh, a record that was so important to me. As a kid, and still is. I mean, I love so many of them, as you know. I uh, but there was a, something you told me once that this audience probably hasn't heard about side four on that record. Now that side four, which is so incredible, um, it was it was pretty much a live recording, right? I mean, there were all these people in the studio. Can you kind of give me the backstory of that again? Because it's that story still blows my mind about you know everything that you were doing by the time you were. Maybe you can kind of backtrack and tell about something, anything that double album. Well, I had not originally intended for it to be a double album. Um, but when I started recording, I just like, I was living by myself in LA. I moved to LA for a year and uh, just filled up every spare moment with some sort of, you know, work on the record. I would go to the studio during the day and work until probably about dinner time and then have dinner and go home. And then I had an eight track machine set up in my house <laughs> and I would yeah. just do other weird things that I was a less, uh, just mo- mostly experimental things. You know, when I went into the studio, I pretty much knew what I was going to do. But when I was at home, I had the opportunity to just kind of, free up and fiddle around with things like breathless. And I went to the mirror and that sort of, yeah. uh, that sort of weirdness, you know? So, uh, I was kind of just making music all the time. Uh, and, uh, as the story goes, a friend of mine <laughs> turned me on a riddle and, and that only drew, drove the thing even further, you know? Yeah. So that may have been a contributing factor why I was coming up with so much material. And uh, at a certain point, I realized it's going to be a double album, but I didn't want to do yet another side of just me 
solo material. So I said, let's go back to our so-called roots. Because when I was in the NAS and we were trying to get a record deal, there was no such thing as overdubbing anything. You know, <laughs> you, yeah. you got a half an hour of studio time to record as many songs as you could live. And so uh, I decided that, that I wanted to do a side of just all live recordings, which I did in various contexts. And it was also an opportunity for me to like work with uh, with some musicians that I wanted to work with, you know, that I hadn't uh, had an opportunity to play with. Uh, I may have produced a record with them or something like that. And uh, and that, you know, that was kind of fun. And then, you know, we did a three session, three song session in New York City of which, hello, it's me. Uh, you left me sore. And Piss Aaron. Piss Aaron's great. And Slot. And all those songs. There's some classics on there. Yeah. I mean, you know. Uh, yeah. All in one kind of relatively long Sunday afternoon. I got got it in my head in the morning that I wanted to do a different version of Hello, It's Me. And I had a couple other songs. So I called up Moogie Klingman and I said, you know, I want to do a session. You know, Moogie was kind of like my contractor. He knew all the musicians and everything. So I said, I want to do a session this afternoon. And so he got the Brecker Brothers. Yeah, they weren't the Brecker Brothers band yet, you know. But it was, uh, it was Mike and Randy and Barry and uh, and uh, and I think uh, Rick Derringer was on at least half of the sessions there, and and uh, John Sigler was on bass. It was just like incredible collection of musicians and uh, a good segment of the cast from Hair. To sing backgrounds yeah so all the backgrounds that you hear on hello it's me is actually the cast of hair wow. the original broadway cast of hair wow that's amazing i mean and hello it's me became obviously such a, a huge hit and was a song mm -hmm. you'd originally written for for nas and recorded with them so it's so great that people got to hear it and then they came out on this record and that you went back and did that and i just love the you know natural feeling of the record when you when you sing, you left me sore and your voice cracks and then you're la you hear laughing. Yeah. It's just one of the most beautiful, magical moments on a record that you just, you know, it was like no one did anything like that at that period of time. And I thought it was it was just so endearing. It was one of those things that you uh, fall in love with and never forget those things on a record. Um, and then there's a woman who is probably one of the cast here going, I'm falling in love with the singer and all the other stuff they're talking during the record. And it's kind of cool, you know, the whole thing. Well, years and years later, you know, I kind of I revisited that whole approach when I started doing, uh, when I did Nearly Human and Second Wind. Yeah. Getting everybody in the studio and doing it all in one take. Uh, it is a completely different vibe uh, than, you know, the usual sort of overdub, get the rhythm track tight and that sort of thing. Um, it's that kind of, uh, there's a there's a quantum aspect about it that makes all of that makes everybody's little vague mistakes completely disappear you know yeah. into the greater thing you know um because it, you know if you solo the tracks usually on sort of a live recording everyone's inevitably bound to forget their part at one point for a second you know and goof it up but you never notice that you know because there's something else that's catching your attention at the time and uh and that sort of combination of little mistakes, uh, uh, daring sort of, you're not sure whether this is going to work, but you're going to try it, you know, and you go, oh, wow, it works, you know? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Kind of the, the object of doing things live, you know, not doing it exactly the way, exactly the same every single time. There's always something a little bit different with every take, and then you try and find the one that's got that so-called magic. Yeah, I mean, but you know, it's historically those are all great records, and for that reason, and it's the beauty of a lot of things in the history of music, uh, you know, whether it's rock, R and B, or pop, are those mistakes, those little things that give it so much character. You know what I mean? And like you said, the group of of people. Well, it's like you know, please, please me. John sings the wrong words in the middle of it, laughs. Yeah, and then, <laughs> most people don't even remember that. Yeah, exactly. Which is which is so great. You know, I, we we got to talk also about the. I mean, there's so much to talk about, Todd. And I know I, I keep you all day because 
I mean, I think last time we were together, we went from like all the way from Philly into Naz to, to Faithful, and then you and I both had to be somewhere, so we left the radio station in New York. But we were like literally went through and talked about all, I mean, everything. Wizard of True Star, Todd, we went through all those records, Runt. I mean, and I had a great time. For me, for a big fan, it was unbelievable. But um, I do got to talk to you about this celebrating David Bowie uh, thing. And, you know, you mentioned earlier about living in New York and hanging out in New York. And I know you guys both around the same time sometimes would hang at Max's Kansas City. That was like kind of a hang for, for the scene there, right? Nightly. It was, not, it was a nightly thing for me. <laughs> you know, like I say, I, I live five blocks away. And at a certain point in the evening, I would go over to Max's Kansas City and see what was going on. And usually you'd see the same kind of people. And, you know, and me and like Tony Sales would sit down and between us kill a bottle of Bushmills, yeah. go home and wake up the next day with no hangover at all. <laughs> yeah, because when you were young, because you know, you could so do young, that. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. so, um, but yeah, it was like it really was kind of for a while. There were just two places in New York that sort of mattered. Maybe three places in New York that mattered. Um, there was Steve Paul's The Scene. Yeah. Uh, where everybody who came to New York for the first time played, you know, after they did their gig, after they did their paying gig, they would come and uh, play at the scene. And I saw so many acts there for the first time before they made it big. Um, who were some of those? And, I'm sure and there Andrew. was the, uh, the Cafe A Go Go in the village which was a basement place and that's where the other all of the other that's where they had the regular gig that's yeah. where cream played for three nights and i sat three nights in a row and i sat six feet from eric clapton's marshall stack with yeah. my ears freaking burning every <laughs> night so, yeah. you know yeah. and then there was steve paul's uh, and then there was max's kansas city which at first was only a hangout. It wasn't a music venue. And then they opened a music venue on the floor above. Upstairs, yeah. And there I saw, like, before they broke it big, I saw Steely Dan. I saw the Wailers. I saw Iggy Pop solo dive on a broken cocktail tumbler, tumbler and come up with pieces of glass sticking in his chest. You know, yeah, it, yeah. Was, uh, it was a place to, to see and be seen. And... Uh, and it's funny, there aren't many places like that anymore. A lot of it was, um, well, Max's Kansas City, you had to be of drinking age because yeah. it was a bar, basically a bar. But Steve Paul's and uh, and the uh, Cafe Agogo were all ages. Yeah. And, you know, and the minimum that you had to buy was essentially like a flower vase full of milkshake <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to see some great rock you know he sat there music. with a, he sat there with like a 20 dollar milkshake <laughs> yeah sipping it all through you know oh watching my. uh uh big bill brunzi or something yeah. like that yeah. yeah that's amazing yeah but those those, those days yeah there was a the infamous show i guess upstairs and i mean aerosmith obviously got signed up there at max's and there's the show. There's the the, the Whalers played Bob Marley and the Whalers when either they were opening or Bruce Springsteen and the Easter Band were opening on the same bill upstairs in that small room. And, it's unbelievable. and it was a tiny little place too. I yeah. mean, not, couldn't hold more than a hundred people. Yeah, unbelievable. So, so yeah. tell me about that. You and Bowie, and, and let's talk about you're doing this with Adrian, Adrian Ballou, of course, who's played with Bowie. And you guys have done stuff together, and and he's you know obviously on the new record as well, right? And he, um, but can we talk the latest about, single? Yes. Yeah, puzzle, <laughs> right? So he's on puzzle, right? And uh -huh. so, yeah, so which is great. So let's, but let's talk about the idea to do this uh, Bowie celebration. Where this came from, Todd, and what what this evening is going to be like. Well, it wasn't my idea, yeah. um, obviously, but I got invited to participate in this thing like years ago and now it's probably four three four years ago and it was just for one gig it was for a weekend in iceland playing uh david bowie with the icelandic national orchestra yeah <laughs> and uh it was a, it was a very interesting weekend for me you know the weather was horrible everyone said you know you got to go to iceland Reykjavik. it's lovely you know but the weather was horrible so 
spent a lot of time, you know, just in a tiny little hotel room and then going to the gig. But it certainly was a uh, um, fairly spectacular uh, presentation, you know, to have not only the range of David Bowie's material, but have it fully orchestrated as well, much of it. So uh, I did that. Then the band, the, the rest of the band, I think they went on and did a South American tour, something very grueling that I never would have done. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this tour is going to be pretty grueling as well. But um, essentially, it's uh, not exactly the same lineup. Some of the same people, of course, um, Adrian and the guy named Scrote. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not going to explain that. <laughs> yeah. Scrote. Uh, I do love that uh, nickname, though. It's great. Angelo creative. from Fishbone is also going to be on parts of it. Yeah. Uh, uh, I believe that Royston Langdon used to be from uh, Space Hog. Uh, right, Space Hog. Yeah, exactly. And also was was once married to my daughter. Uh, That's <laughs> right. Also yeah. Be there. And uh, and special guesting, I think, in Annapolis only David Bo. Uh, David. What am I talking about? Thomas Dolby will yeah. be sitting in doing, well, who's also uh, on your new record which is cool you know yeah. yeah and he's also on the new record and we'll be releasing a single with thomas as well sometime uh in the next uh, month or so you know it's uh crazy todd I, I i was in reykjavik and the thing that really blew my mind about being there was walking around the town and coming up to the supermarket and the mothers leave all their babies in the carriages while they're inside shopping with nobody watching them. So there were literally like <laughs> 15 baby carriages with babies in them. And I'm like, what? Where are the parents? I'm like, what's going on? You know, thinking Free, of America. Take one. <laughs> it was unbelievable. <laughs> I will never forget that. That was insane. I guess there's not a lot of baby napping in there. Yeah. You know? oh, who wants a freaking infant anyway? Yeah, right. right. Exactly. It's like, yeah, here you go. It's so high maintenance. It's so, yeah. yeah. And it was funny because I asked one of the guys there who was involved with Gus Gus and Bjork, and, and they said to me, oh, there's no crime here. And if there is, it's usually one of two people, and the cops go right to their house. <laughs> so That's great. what I mean. There's no place to hide. <laughs> I just want to. Yeah, it's unbelievable. <laughs> Except for maybe the hot springs, and even then. Yeah, no, exactly. Right, it's crazy. But uh, no, but that sounds like it's going to be fun, for, uh, and it'll be a great time. And you got you and David, obviously. Uh, you know, we used to see each other at Max's and other places, and you were contemporaries there, making making records and in, in that in the early years when he first came over to America, or first or second time. And um, I'm just I'm I'm really happy to, and excited to see what stuff you you decide to do. Are you going to be doing? vocals and keys on a, on a lot of the tracks that you're playing uh i'm i'm pretty lucky i get to do a lot of the more familiar material yeah. like you know claimed it early yeah that's <laughs> a good I move get, right it's I like I, do, I get to do life on mars you know space oddity and yeah you know that sort of stuff so i'm bound to get a good reaction yeah that's great <laughs> And I can see you doing those great. I, you know, I, I can't wait to hear you do Life on Mars. I think that'll be a really uh, great. Uh, I actually, I did a recorded version for a Bowie tribute record several yeah. years ago. So that's kind of probably how I got it locked in. Yeah, I'm going to have to dig that out. I'm sorry that I hadn't heard that, but I will. Well, the irony is that just about the time that I left upstate New York is when he moved to upstate New York and, and essentially went he passed he was living about less than a mile and a half from my house in lake hill in upstate new york where you know i made many records for myself and for other people in so, bearsville uh, right in bearsville yeah, it was strange irony i might have we might have become you know more neighbors except i moved away at the same time that he got there yeah you you moved to hawaii at that point right yeah well i moved first to san francisco yeah um uh, I had, you know, my kids were getting uh, to school age and there weren't a lot of uh, alternatives. Uh, you know, we were living isolated up in the mountainside. And so socializing, you know, and school alternatives were getting pretty slim. And I was uh, I was interested in getting into a musical scene that I felt comfortable in. I was never part of the uh, of the Bearsville, the upstate musical scene that was of uh, that had a, its roots in folk music and stuff like that and i was never a folk artist um 
And so I went to, so we moved to San Francisco and that's when I started doing like my live records with all of the incredible, incredible musicians that were um, living in the Bay Area at the time. Yeah. Oh, those re- those records are great. Now I was really happy too when they put out the box set of all the Utopia concerts too. Were great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have those. You know, I mean, there's just some great stuff there. You know, it's I, I love to see the way the set list changed on uh, and over the different times and years and you know, so it was it was cool. But let, you know, Todd, I, I gotta tell you, I know that um, I gotta thank you for taking as much time as you did today with me. But I'm very excited about the new record, um, and I just wanted to tell everybody about Space Force again, and also about the show at the Saban Theater, which is happening October 7th. It's, uh, I'm, I'm pumped for you and Adrian to be there playing together, and whoever else. Angelo from Fishbone, you can't go wrong. Angelo's such a great character, you know? Can't go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? It's awesome. But listen, uh, you know, thank you for taking the time. It's, it, was, it was always great catching up with you, you know? My pleasure. I need an excuse to shave. Yeah. <laughs> well, you look great, and, and I'm looking forward to it. And by the way, uh, you, so, we'll, so we'll reconnect uh, when you're here in town, but uh, I look forward to seeing you. I did Last time I ran into you, I saw you. You were doing this tour with Yes, so I saw the one you, you did here at the— Oh, uh, yeah. At the, well, um, with one of the Yeses. One of the Yeses, yeah. One there of were the two, two Yeses, yeses. on tour at the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it, was, but it was great to see you there. So okay. Todd, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, man. I'll talk to you soon. All right, you got it. Thank you so much. Todd Rundgren, everybody. Thanks, Todd. Thanks. Love Todd Bye. Rundgren. Good, great to have him on the show. It's KLOS, new and approved. I'm Matt Pinfield. Thanks so much for joining us.